Good morning and a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us live in this uh, PRL colloquium. We are extremely honored to have Professor Alexander Timmons as our speaker for today. On behalf of uh, PRL, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome to the Chilean, who is joining us live from the US. It's pretty late in the evening, so I already know that he's joining us at this time. Uh, I uh, also I would like to thank you, Mr. Chilean, for kindly accepting our invitation and agreeing to deliver this, this uh, colloquium at PRL. Uh, I also uh, invite uh, people from the University of Maryland and the Leiden University who are who is joining us in this forum. It is, uh, I will now request uh, Dr. Balanjagan Sivarani, my colleague, to uh, formally introduce our uh, speaker and conduct the proceedings. Thank you, Professor Pallan. Thank you. Professor Pallan. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all. And Professor uh, Tillings, good evening to you. Uh, thanks for accepting the invitation. Uh, as uh, Professor uh, Dean has uh, uh, told that it is, uh, it, we have a big time difference between us, but still thank you for uh, accepting. So Professor Tillings uh, is a professor of astronomy at both the Leiden University and the University of Maryland. He has held appointments at the University of California in Berkeley, NASA Ames Research Center, University of Groningen, and the Dutch Space Agency was a project scientist of the HIFI instrument on board the Herschel Space Observatory and was a NASA project scientist of the SOFIA. He's a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and was awarded the Spinoza Prize in 2012. For students, especially those who uh, start astrochemistry, we cannot uh, you know, uh, uh, skip his book, The Physics and Chemistry of the Interstellar Media, which is very, very interesting and very important for those who are entering this field. He's the most cited astronomer in the Netherlands. He's also known for the groundbreaking work on uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the PHS, and the photo dissociation regions. He's among the first to recognize the importance of large molecules in space. So I can keep on telling about Professor Tillins' contribution to the astrochemistry. He's the editor of, uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the Molecular Astrophysics Journal, as well as he's the editor-in-chief for the AstroPH newsletter from the Leiden Observatory. Of course, his contributions to astrochemistry are enormous. So with this, I will uh, uh, pass it on to Professor Tillins because we are all waiting to hear from, from him about the molecular universe. Thank, thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, I, I much appreciate it. Uh, I would have liked to be in here uh, to give this impression that the pandemic is not the possible. Um, but what I will do today is take you away from the pandemic and take you into the molecular universe. Uh, the molecular universe is something that we sort of discovered over the last 20, 30 years. We have discovered that molecules are present everywhere in the universe. Uh, there is a very diverse and very rich uh, organic inventory. And molecules play an important part in the universe and that we can use them to study the universe. And uh, it, it's those aspects that I will like uh, to, to introduce to you today in this uh, in this talk. And uh, let, let me start off by backing up a little bit and, and uh, tell you really that we live in very special times. We live in a time where uh, our view of the universe is changing very rapidly. And, and this is one of those things that make that change. This is uh, the, the Kepler Orrery. This is the Kepler mission. They went out to st uh, study um, planets uh, or discover planets around stars. And, and this is a, a collection of all the multiple planet systems that they had discovered in 2012. And, and you can see that they're very diverse uh, and, and, and very rich. And one of the things that basically came out of, these, uh, of the Kepler study and other studies as well, is that uh, every uh, star um, in our galaxy has a planetary system. Basically, planetary systems are everywhere. 
Now, many of those are, uh, certainly many of the, the ones that were discovered, are um, jazz, gas giants and close to the host star. And then these are two artists' impressions of what it would be like on such a, on such a planet. And, and uh, such a planet is maybe not uh, the, the most interesting planet for us personally. Uh, we, uh, we really are looking for, for Goldilocks. You may remember the story of Goldilocks. I have told it many times to my children when they were small. Uh, Goldilocks went walking in the forest and came across this little cottage, the cottage of the three bears. And she went inside and she sat in uh, one chair that was too hard, another chair was too soft, but one chair was just right. There was one bowl of porridge which was too hot, one bowl of porridge which was too cold, and one bowl of porridge which was just right. We are looking for planets that are just right for life. And uh, that's why we have, uh, the Kepler mission has contributed uh, uh, considerably because um, uh, one of the outcomes of the Kepler mission was that one in five of stars like the sun has a planetary system, is a planet like the Earth, in the habitable zone. So in the habitable zone is here defined as where water would be liquid. That of course makes it a, a, a tremendous, a tremendous amount of planets like the Earth uh, that are uh, present everywhere. We're probably talking about um, a, a billion planets that, uh, that are like the Earth that could uh, may sustain life. And so that's one of the, the big discoveries uh, that we made over the last uh, 20 years. The other thing that we discovered is that uh, when we look at the Earth, then we can find life everywhere. And this is the Grand uh, Prismatic Spring in the Yellowstone National Park in uh, Montana in the US. And you see these, uh, this steaming water here. The water is of the order of uh, 70 degrees Celsius. It's really very, very hot. Uh, it's not uh, sustainable for us, for ourselves, but you see all the beautiful colors around it. Those beautiful colors are cre uh, created by cyanobacteria. They're happily living there, They're happily living in this uh, very hot uh, and, and inhospitable uh, environment. Uh, this is another example of where life is. This is a lake bed under the ice in the Antarctic. And uh, you can see here these, uh, these uh, um, hills here, these, these stromalite uh, bacterial colonies. These stromalites are just like the first life forms that were present on Earth. And that were present here in the colder spots uh, where, uh, on Earth. This is another example. This is the driest spot on Earth. This is the Atacama Desert in the Andes uh, in, in Chile. And when you dig down here to a few meters deep, you'll find these little salt uh, pellets. And on top of those salt pellets, there are microbes who are living there happily because the, the salt sort of collects the water in this arid environment. And, and so, uh, we, this, this is then my last example. This is uh, tube worms and mussels that live at a hydrothermal vent in the deepest spots of the oceans, in the trenches, uh, in, in the Earth's crust. And uh, there is no light here. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, this life that is here lives all from chemosynthetic bacteria. And so what we have discovered over the last um, uh, 20 years is that life can live, can, can be present in many different environments, very hot, very cold, uh, very dry, very wet, of course, but also in an environment where, uh, where light is not present. So life um, uh, has spread and occupied all niches on the earth. And the last thing that I want to impress on you is this uh, timeline uh, of, the, uh, of the Earth. Uh, this is where we are now. Uh, this is 4.56 billion years ago when the, the Earth was formed by putting rocks together. And of course, that made a lot of, liberated a lot of energy that created a magma ocean. And uh, after, you know, 200 million years or so, 150 million years, the uh, uh, the Earth's crust formed, and we find the first Jack Hill uh, zircons, the first uh, 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 fragments of that crust that we can find back in uh, in Australia that date back to about this area. Of course, once you have a crust, you can think about forming life, uh, and and we. Uh, 
We then had a late heavy bombardment, uh, about uh, 3.8 billion years ago, 3.9 billion years ago, when uh, asteroids and cometary bodies came in and slammed the Earth. If life had been present before that time, it would have been completely uh, obliterated. Then the uh, uh, a number of um, uh, fossils that indicate the presence of life, the one that uh, most people would uh, really accept are these uh, charred fossils that date back to maybe 3.5 billion years ago. That's only really 200 million years after the sterilization of the Earth by the late uh, heavy bombardment. And so life can really form and uh, evolve uh, uh, very, very quickly after the conditions are there. And then, of course, life took off and eventually wound up with the dinosaurs and us here uh, at, uh, at the present time. So we've learned a lot of things. Uh, planets are everywhere. Life occupies all niches on the Earth. And life started almost immediately. And uh, that has led to a new paradigm, a paradigm where uh, we now think that life is widespread in the universe. And it, it presents uh, may even in this planet here that is circling these two, this double star in, uh, in this system. And uh, uh, that led to the Star Wars uh, uh, tri trilogy. Uh, uh. So uh, that's really a new paradigm. That's um, a, a new view of the universe. And uh, that has brought back to us uh, very much um, uh, this, this quest for understanding the origin of life, not only at our planet, but uh, elsewhere in the universe. And so you have to start with putting the, the, uh, the uh, planets together. You do that in a uh, protoplanetary disk. You can see here's the, the young star in the middle. And you see this disk of dust and gas. And you see that uh, planets are there and accreting uh, material from it. And uh, there are a number of, uh, may, well, maybe I should emphasize that this, there's a strong temperature gradient in this, uh, in this disk. So everything is very hot, close to the, the, the central star, but much colder and even icy at the outskirts. And uh, may, the organic inventory that will be sampled by these planets will then very much depend on where the material comes from. Does it come from very close, where everything was hot and much cooked? Or did it come from very far outside, where uh, everything was cold and iced and uh, not much chemistry uh, uh, happened? And so there are a number of steps that uh, are involved in making planets. And this is, in fact, a little video that illustrates the first step. This is the mass of the planetesimals. This is the distance from the sun. And so we're talking here, this is the inner solar system. And, and this is the outer solar system. And uh, when I start this, uh, this video, then you can see that uh, bodies are growing. And they're growing faster in the inner uh, region because the densities are higher. And uh, at the outer region, they, they, they sort of get stopped. And in the inner region, you form things which are of the order of a planetesimal, an asteroid uh, kind of body. In the outer regions, you're really stuck uh, at making pebbles. But those pebbles actually drift in. And that's what these lines indicate. They are streamlines. You can see that those pebbles uh, stream in, and they can be caught by uh, planetary bodies in the inner part. And so a planetary body that is formed actually samples a wide range of uh, conditions. Of course, much of the material comes from nearby where it is formed, but then it also has this rain of pebbles coming in and bringing in material from the outside. This is then the next step. Uh, we have now a disk uh, of, uh, of embryos that are going to form some planets. The, the sun is here. This is uh, in AU, so this is where the Earth is uh, going to be, uh, Mars and, and Venus. And these are planetesimals, and the color here indicates the, uh, the content uh, of, of water and of organics. So this is uh, mainly rocky, this is organics, and this is uh, water rich. And, and uh, what's shown here is the distance, and this is the eccentricity. And when I start this video, you can see that uh, Jupiter is scattering these uh, planetesimals in eccentricity. And when you have a highly eccentric orbit, that means that you start to collide. That means that you start to form uh, bigger bodies, and that's what you see here. You see a number of larger planets form. And here you actually already see three uh, planets form, uh, Venus, uh, the Earth, and, uh, and Mars. 
And you can also see that the color of these uh, planets changed. It started off very red because it created mainly material from nearby, which was rocky. But uh, in the end, it started to create all this material out here, which was much bluer, which contained both organics and, uh, and uh, water. You can see that now, after some uh, 200 million years, all of this has uh, disappeared, all of these planetesimals, and we wind up with, uh, with three planets. And uh, so that's, that's um, another reservoir that uh, a terrestrial planet will, will uh, tap. That's the asteroidal belt uh, where conditions are more favorable for the, uh, for the uh, preservation of organics and uh, water. This is then the last one that I want to show is again a video. We are now looking at a, a scale size. Huh? This is the sun, this is Jupiter, the orbit of Jupiter, the orbit, orbit of Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. And these green dots are the uh, are decimals. And uh, I start this off, and uh, what happens is that every now and then uh, one of these comets scatters off Jupiter and is kicked out. And as a result, Jupiter moves in a little bit. And so this goes on for a long, long time. We're now at uh, the almost 400 million years and not much seems to be happening, but you have to be uh, pay attention because at a certain point in time, this will change dramatically. And we're, uh, we're, we're almost there uh, that it really will change uh, all of a sudden. Here it is. What happened is that Jupiter and Saturn got into, uh, into resonance. That meant that uh, Neptune uh, jump fogged Uranus. Neptune's orbit now came into the, uh, into the orbit of the cometesimals. All those cometesimals got scattered away. Uh, most of them got scattered out, but some of them got scattered in. And some of them scattered in and uh, hit the terrestrial planets. So the, uh, the craters that you see, the big craters that you see on the moon are remnants of this process, the late heavy bombardment when the cometary bodies from the outer solar system came in and crashed in the moon. They of course also crashed in, into the earth, much more in the earth than actually the moon, but the record of that has disappeared because of erosion. But on the moon it is preserved, and so we can still trace that. And uh, these um, uh, cometesimals, of course, also brought in a lot of material that was cold, that was um, uh, hardly processed, and it was largely interstellar in, uh, in origin. And so we see that um, uh, the, the, the terrestrial planets and the Earth uh, have sampled a wide variety of, uh, of materials in the, the solar nebula, in the solar system. Uh, and of course, much of the, uh, of the outer uh, regions uh, of the solar system had a uh, organic composition that was set in the interstellar medium, uh, while in the inner solar system things were uh, uh, processed by uh, the high temperatures uh, and, and the UV radiation from the star. And then, and then it came in, either in the form of these comets or asteroids. It still comes in in the form of interplanetary dust particles, and we can still collect meteorites. All of that, of course, came to the Earth, where then further synthesis and further uh, uh, organic processes could convert things and could start life. And uh, it, it's important to realize that, say, that, that heritage matters. Uh, where we come from or where uh, the, uh, the, the terrestrial planets came from does make a lot of difference. And that I illustrate that here with the composition calculated for uh, a, 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 a atmosphere. Uh, uh, and, and this is an atmosphere which consists of eight chondrite materials, so eight chondrite meteorite materials, has that kind of composition. It's fairly uh, hydrogen rich, and so you can see that there is a lot of methane present, a lot of water, and CO2 is really not very abundant. Ammonia is present as well, and it's in this environment that the Uri Miller uh, process can take off, and that you can make um, a lot of um, uh, prebiotic materials prebiotic molecules that are very important uh, for the origin of life. But this is another example, this uh, CI chondrite materials. Uh, CI chondrite materials are actually much more oxidized. And so on a planet that's mainly formed from this kind of uh, material, uh, oxygen is much more important. And you can see that most of the carbon is locked up in CO2. 
And in this kind of an environment, it is very difficult to jumpstart uh, the uh, uh, life. It's very difficult to uh, uh, to get the Uri Miller uh, process going. And so in this uh, kind of environment, you have to bring in the, uh, the uh, molecules that you want to use to start, uh, to start life. And uh, wondering about the origin of life is not new. Uh, Darwin, of course, uh, came up uh, with, this, uh, with this conundrum already that if there is a tree of life and if life evolves, then there must have been a starting point. And where was that starting point? And what were the initial conditions? And so he conceived that we had a little warm pond with all sorts of uh, ammonia and salts and light and heat, electricity, and lots of things were present. And, and that he envisioned could make the first proteins and uh, that could then undergo further chemical processing uh, to eventually uh, lead to life. And uh, let me uh, emphasize again uh, that this, this is uh, an interesting uh, idea that was studied in, uh, in the 50s by Yuri Miller when they did a little experiment. They had a bulb in which there was water that represented the oceans. There were some uh, organics dissolved in it. And then, they, of course, they heated a little bit so uh, that you had cloud formation, droplets coming out. Those were led to a chamber where a spark uh, initiated uh, chemistry. That is the primitive atmosphere. The, the spark gave you the energy. Then you had uh, uh, the organics uh, condense out uh, and you uh, had a collecting trap. You, this was run many, many, many times. And uh, what they discovered is that when you analyzed uh, the, the, mo the molecules formed and you found amino acids. And this is this, this, this Uri Miller experiment. This is a well-known chemical process, the structure synthesis. If you have a reducing atmosphere with ammonia and, and, and formaldehyde present, then you can easily make, uh, with a few steps, you can make amino acids. And you can envision that, uh, that uh, Darwin was right, that life could form this way. But that's, of course, in a... Uh, in a, uh, in a uh, reducing atmosphere, if you started off on a planet with a oxidizing atmosphere, are you then out of luck? Does that mean that life cannot form? Not necessarily, because we um, we find these meteorites on Earth, these carbonaceous meteorites. This is an example, the Murchison meteorite. And when we analyze the uh, content of these meteorites, we find a, a very diverse uh, array of chemicals present, including many amino acids, and many of the amino acids that are important uh, for life as we, uh, as we know it. And so on an oxidizing environment, you could still have a meteorite come in and bring the uh, materials that you need uh, and drop it into a warm pond in which then life can, uh, can evolve. So the idea that life is widespread uh, is, is certainly very viable because you can bring in the materials from the outside, you can bring in the materials uh, that can jumpstart to life. And so that's really the idea of, of molecular astrophysics, huh? that's trying to understand this, what's the organic inventory of regions of planet formation, is that related to the molecular inventory of the Earth, does that uh, apply to terrestrial planets in the solar system, does that apply to exoplanets? But it's actually bigger than that. Uh, there is also the question, do molecules play a role in the evolution of the universe? Is it important that there are molecules present or are they just bystanders in the evolution of the, uh, the universe? Would the universe look the same if no molecules were present? It's an interesting question to, to consider. And then uh, the last one is, of course, we are all uh, astronomers. And astronomers like to study the universe, and uh, one of the ways uh, we might study the universe is by using molecules. Molecules can be used as tracers of the universe. And so I'll, 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 in this talk, I will give you some examples of each of these, uh, these three questions, uh, just to illustrate uh, for you uh, um, uh, what, uh, what molecular astrophysics is concerned with. Uh, the molecular astrophysics is much broader than what I will present here, but I, I'll illustrate these three points uh, with some examples uh, uh, from uh, uh, recent studies. And then we have to go back um, uh, to the interstellar medium. We are going back and we're going to think about what is the organic inventory of the interstellar medium, particularly regions of star and planet formation. And for a long time, we thought that uh, organic uh, molecules were formed mainly from small to big. 
So you had atoms that came together that formed simple molecules like CO that got hydrogenated forming methanol or ethanol or dimethyl ether. And those molecules then got collected into uh, ice grains and into comets and asteroids and those delivered them then to the uh, nascent Earth. And, and for, for many years, for a long time, this was thought to be the only mechanism present, but we have now discovered that there's actually a, a second route as well, where we go from big to small. Uh, stars, uh, like the sun, when they are growing old, they lose much of their mass in the form of a gentle wind. In that wind, the, the conditions are such that uh, it's high, high pressures, high densities, high temperatures, Conditions like um, you have in your uh, car engine and in which uh, molecules and soot can form. And stars are really, in that sense, just uh, sooting candles. And then they eject that into the interstellar medium. In the interstellar medium, those materials get cooked. Uh, the UV and photons and uh, energetic particles process this and break down these large molecules, these sooting molecules that are formed in these outflows and break them down to smaller molecules. All of that gets collected again in comets and asteroids and then delivered to the uh, solar system, to, to, to terrestrial planets. And um, the story that I will be telling today will center on this second route, this route where you go from big to small, where you start off with uh, with suiting kind of uh, molecules, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules, and we're going to see how those can be used to study the, uh, the universe, what they contribute to the universe, and um, uh, how they uh, inf influence the organic inventory of the universe. And so let me take you to, uh, to uh, some infrared spectroscopy. Uh, that's how we discovered that these large molecules were present. These are two spectra uh, representative of uh, most of the interstellar medium, and they show very broad features at 3.3, 6.2, 7.7, 8.6, 11.2, and 12.7. And uh, these are uh, present everywhere, and they are readily identified as uh, CH stretching and uh, CC stretching modes in the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules. In short, PAS. And uh, let me illustrate to you what uh, what uh, the signature is. Here is that spectrum: three, three, six, two, seven, seven, eight, six. Uh, uh, 11, 2, and 12, 7. And here are the typical uh, uh, vibrations that are involved in different bands. These are the, uh, the CH stretch, um, where the uh, hydrogens are stretching in the plane. This is the uh, 6.2 uh, CC stretch, where the carbon atoms are stretching in the uh, molecule itself, in the carbon skeleton. Here we have the in-plane bending modes, where you can see that the hydrogens are bending in the plane, they're sort of waving at us, uh, so to speak. And these are the out-of-plane bending modes uh, that, that where the hydrogen atoms are moving through the plane up and down. And these are very characteristic for this kind of molecules, and uh, this is a signature that's readily uh, recognized. And, and once, once, of course, you know this signature, you can say, okay, um, let's, let's not just uh, isolate uh, with a narrow band filter uh, the uh, emission from uh, in one of these bands and let's see what the universe looks like in that light and so let's first go to Orion this is the Orion Nebula here's the trapezium stars you see here uh, this uh, red glow that's the recombination of uh, of hydrogen there's the H alpha line you can see in H2 region hot gas uh, and up here you see a reflection nebula uh, centered around uh, some other stars this is what you see in the visible. If we had to molecularize, if we could see what it looked like to these molecules, then this is what we would see. And you would see that this whole region is set to glow in, uh, in the light of these molecules. These, uh, these stars, the trapezium stars, send out UV radiation. UV radiation pumps these molecules electronically, and they then relax by emitting in the infrared in these bands. And we basically have here, uh, this is a Spitzer image, have isolated the, uh, uh, the light of these molecules to see what the universe looked like. And this is on the scale size of um, a few parsecs. Uh, this is um, a four parsecs in size. And so on that scale size, the whole uh, region is set aglow in the light of these molecules. 
This is another example. This is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. You can see here is the, the nucleus. You see these beautiful spiral arms uh, uh, tracing uh, the uh, interstellar medium here. If uh, you can see these blue dots in this, these blue dots are regions like Orion. So there is a star there, a hot star that's illuminating its environment, setting it glow. And uh, this is what you would see in the visible. This is what you would see in the infrared. You can see again, we have isolated these molecules, and you can see again that uh, the uh, uh, the whole galaxy now, the scale size of tens of kiloparsecs, is set to glow in the light of these molecules. These molecules are everywhere and uh, ubiquitous, and they are very abundant because they dominate uh, the light here. Uh, this is on the scale size of uh, tens of kiloparsecs. Uh, let's now zoom in on a uh, protoplanetary disk. This is the, around the star HD 97048. The star would be here. It's unresolved in this image. This is the disk, the protoplanetary disk. And uh, I've changed the color scale here. Uh, the green is now the light of these uh, of these molecules. And this is a scale size now. That's the scale size of our uh, own solar system. This is of the order of um, 200 uh, AU. And so this is where the comets would be uh, in, in our own uh, solar system. And so you can see that on that scale size, these molecules are present uh, in, in, in the whole uh, disk as well. So we're talking about these interstellar paths, the, interstellar, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules. So they have this, this uh, honeycomb uh, structure, this uh, chicken wire structure, uh, six rings which are fused together. And you can do that many different ways, and each of these is a separate molecule with its own uh, characteristics. The typical power in the interstellar medium contains uh, some 50 carbon atoms, and uh, some 5% of the carbon in the interstellar medium is locked up in these molecules. It's clear that they're important, it's clear that they're ubiquitous, it's clear that they're everywhere. And so I will illustrate molecular astrophysics on the basis of, the, of these molecules. So they may see how we can use them to study the universe. We can see what paths contribute to the universe, how do they influence the universe, and we can uh, study uh, what paths contribute to the organic inventory of the universe. And let's start here with uh, studying how we can use paths to study the universe. And one of the first things we discovered is that uh, there's a large difference in the spectrum of the ionized paths, here indicated by blue, and neutral paths, here indicated by red. This is again a spectrum from about 5 to 20 microns. And you can see that the CH modes are particularly strong in the neutral paths, while the CC modes are particularly strong in the uh, uh, cations. And so that, what that means is that we can in, infer the ionization state of the emitting molecules by just comparing uh, the strength of the emission in this region with the strength of the emission in this region. And that's what's done here. This is a set of spectra of different uh, galaxies, and they're all normalized in such a way that the neutral bands are equally strong. And you can see that the ionized bands really vary a lot. This is a uh, different galaxies. This is inside M82, the uh, uh, cigar galaxy. And you can see that uh, may, there is a large variation in the uh, in these uh, uh, different bands, indicating a large variation in the ionic state of the past. And that, of course, must depend on the uh, physical conditions in the region. And so we have calibrated this. Uh, what is shown here is an ion band over neutral bands along this axis. And along this axis, it's basically the ionization parameter, basically the ionization rate over the recombination rate. And that was determined by studying regions in a different, uh, using various atomic and molecular uh, tracers to determine what the uh, density is, because a very dense region will have a lot of electrons around and will neutralize uh, your pass, and so you will have very strong neutral bands and very weak ion bands. On the other hand, when you have a strong UV radiation field, then uh, you will ionize your PAHs and your ionic bands will, very strong, will be very strong compared to the neutral bands. And so here you have a tool. We can now look at a galaxy far, far away, and we can study, the, the measure these, uh, these bands, and then we can say, oh, that means that 
this is what the uh, what the ionization parameter is. This this is what the ratio of ionization rate over recombination rate. This is what the UV field over electron density uh, ratio is. And we did do that by calibrating uh, uh, these observations, uh, these uh, spectral observations with the conditions of the regions that we uh, see these uh, emissions in. This has also has some implications for the photoelectric effect that I will come back to in a minute. That's one way uh, how we can use uh, PEHs to study the universe. This is another way. Here we're looking at uh, the spectra of, of galaxies. Um, this is a uh, the spec uh, spectrum of the uh, NGC 7331. It's a, a galaxy sort of like the, 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 the Milky Way, which is a star formation rate of maybe one solar mass per year. And uh, you can see, you recognize very well the, uh, the power features, uh, as well as many ionic lines due to uh, ionized gas. Uh, and and uh, this is then is M82, which is a nearby starburst. Um, the, uh, we have um, a, a star formation rate, which is one solar mass per year, but now in the nucleus, so really very localized. In a few hundred parsecs, you have a similar star formation rate as in our uh, in our whole galaxy. And you can see that the spectrum really changes. You can still see very clearly those power emission features. There's a silicate absorption feature, and you can see some uh, ionized gas lines as well. Then you can go and look at the spectrum of a ULERC. Uh, it has really changed very much. It, it, uh, we're now talking about a star formation rate of maybe a thousand solar masses per year. You can still see some PEHs and you see a strong continuum. And uh, then we can put all of this together and we can use it as a measure of the starburst uh, rate. Yeah? And uh, along this axis, uh, what is plotted is the AGN activity, that's the ratio of oxygen uh, oxygen 4 line, which is a high ionization state, which needs X-ray photons to produce it, so it needs an AGN. And so when you uh, have a high uh, 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 flux in the oxygen 4 line compared to the other uh, ionic lines, then uh, you have an AGN present. And along this axis is the strength of the 7.7 .7 micron uh, power feature relative to the continuum. And uh, so if you have a strong uh, power feature and you have a lot of UV photons around that are pumping these paths, a lot of UV photons means you have a lot of massive stars, means you have your high uh, star formation rate. And so then you have, this is the data that was taken by the ISO satellites. And you can see that there's a trend uh, going along this, this uh, direction. And then uh, when you have um, uh, some guts, like why not cancel, then you draw a line through this and you put some tick marks on this line where you indicate well, here is where you have no EGN activity with pure starburst activity. Here is where you have pure uh, uh, AGN activity and no starburst. And here in between, uh, both of them contribute. You put some tick marks here, and that way you can uh, uh, infer what the, uh, the relative importance is of AGN activity and starburst activity. And uh, then you can use this to uh, determine what's going on in the galaxy very far away. This is Cloverleaf, this is a uh, redshift of 2.56. You can see weak uh, power features on a strong continuum, and the star formation rate of this is of the order of a thousand solar masses per year. You can also uh, use the, uh, the power features directly and calibrate them as star formation tracers against well known. Uh, um, indicators of star formation rate. This is the passion alpha line, so that's like a, a hardest recombination line, like H alpha, so this is measuring the analyzing uh, photon flux. So this is uh, an indicator of the star formation rate. Oops. And this is the uh, the, uh, the strength of the uh, eight micron uh, in uh, surface brightness. And you can see that there's a nice correlation, and uh, this can be used again. Uh, now it is calibrated, you can use it as an indicator of star formation rate. There are some caveats. You have to uh, take care of the metallicity. Metallicity has some effect as well. And you have these animals here that, uh, uh, that have um, uh, uh, no little uh, star formation activity uh, uh, present, and which are more like ULURCs. So that's uh, how you can use PaaS to study the universe. Let's now turn on how PaaS influence uh, the universe. 
And one of the main ways they do that is through the photoelectric effect. And a uh, photoelectric effect is uh, uh, where they uh, say a dust grain absorbs a UV photon, it ejects an electron, and that electron takes away uh, some excess energy uh, that comes, that kinetic energy is shared with the gas and that heats the gas. This is for dust grains, it's a very inefficient process because the photon is typically absorbed at 100 angstroms inside the grain, and that electron then has to traverse the whole grain before it finds the surface and can escape, and it makes many collisions and shares most of its energy already inside the grain. So it's a very inefficient process if you're talking about a grain, a, 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 a three-dimensional body. On the other hand, if you have a par, then you have the same process. UV photon comes in, it creates an electron, but that electron is at the surface. It will immediately be ejected and it will not lose energy. And so it's very efficient to heat photoelectric, uh, photoelectrically the gas through uh, PEHs. And that's illustrated in this model by, uh, by Emma Bakes. What is shown here is the heating as a function of the size of the uh, species. And this is done in terms of the number of carbon atoms. This is where the pars are, up to 50 to 100 carbon atoms or so. Here we see uh, uh, clusters. These are very small grains. These are small grains. And here are the typical large grains that uh, are characteristics for the extinction of the visible and UV light. And this curve is plotted in such a way that equal areas under this curve give you equal contributions to the heating of the, of the gas. And so you see that half of the heating comes from uh, uh, pars and uh, par molecules and clusters of molecules. Half of it comes from uh, uh, very small grains and large grains do not contribute at all because those electrons never make it out. And then uh, once you have done that, you can make a model for this. And again, uh, you can uh, plot the efficiency of the heating uh, as a function of the ionization parameter. So neutral paths are here, ionized paths are here. And neutral paths are, of course, very efficient because every photon can create a photoelectron. Ionized paths are not very efficient because they are already ionized. And it means that uh, the electron that's created uh, needs more energy to come out because of the law attraction. And uh, there is less uh, photons available to actually ionize it. And so the photoelectric efficiency drops as a function of um, the ionization parameter. And uh, then we can compare this to, uh, to the data that we have. And this is again that same curve. And this is some data that we have measured in various ways uh, of the photoelectric efficiency. So these are direct measurements of the heating efficiency. These are direct measurements of the physical conditions in these regions. Again, that ionization parameter. And you can see that this, these are an, a variety of sources. Um, that sort of follow this trend that um, uh, they are more efficient when the ionization parameter is low, when the species will be neutral, they are less efficient when the species are ionized. But you can also see that there is another factor that influences this as well. And we don't really know what that factor is yet, uh, but we think that may have to do with the, uh, with the composition of the pHs, which specific molecules are present. And uh, because each molecule is, of course, uh, a little bit unique. And, and that leads us to the concept of, of grandpas. Um, yeah, we think it is a family of pHs. On the other hand, the, uh, the spectra for um, uh, the most brightest spot are all very, very similar. It doesn't really matter which uh, region you look at. They all have very, very similar spectra. And that's that led to the notion of grandpas. There are a few paths that are so stable that can uh, really uh, survive anything the universe can throw with them, any UV photons, any uh, particles, energetic particles. And uh, these are uh, then uh, called the grandpas because they are very abundant and they, they, uh, roll, uh, they, roost, they roll, roost the whatever. And uh, it's with some pleasure that I can tell you that a grandpa has been sighted in California. This is, of course, very important to me, but that's not the kind of grandpa that you would be interested in. Uh, they can, uh, you, you might actually wonder why would we as astrochemists really care about the grandpa? And, and this slide is I put it together just to illustrate why that is important. And that illustration really goes back to uh, what we really are. We are chemical factories. 
we are chemical uh, factories and organic chemistry is uh, largely uh, stereochemistry and it's very important what molecule it is and you see on the on the left hand side you see uh, chocolate and the key molecule in chocolate is theobromine which is illustrated here on the right hand side you see uh, cappuccino uh, and the key molecule is caffeine that's illustrated here and uh, actually theobromine and caffeine are very very similar the only difference is that uh, uh, caffeine has a methyl group here where uh, may, excuse me where uh, uh, theobromine has only a single hydrogen atom that's the only difference between these two molecules and now let me tell you that you can have all the chocolate that you want i don't really don't care so much you can have all my chocolate but never ever come between me and my uh, morning cappuccino and uh, so, so it is important what molecules are present because molecules are very specific and have their unique properties. And uh, what molecules were present uh, when the US formed may well have uh, some bearing on how life uh, originated. And so let me now turn to the last uh, part uh, uh, of, of what I wanted to show here to you. Um, and that's the contribution of these large molecules to uh, the organic inventory of space. And I have to take you a little bit on the side track here. This is the, an infrared spectrum of the uh, reflection of the planetary nebula TC, uh, TC1. It has a very unique spectrum. We really do not see. We really do not see the uh, pass here. We see actually a number of bands, 18.9, 17.4, 8.6, and 7.4. And those bands are very characteristic for the C60 molecule, the soccer ball molecule. So that molecule consists of 60 uh, carbon atoms arranged in the form of a soccer ball. We also see some evidence for C70, that's what these blue uh, weaker features are. Um, uh, for Americans, that would be in American football. You can see that soccer balls rule, uh, rule the universe, American football only rule the US. And uh, studying, uh, uh, and this, this spectrum is very, uh, very unique. Uh, and it's, uh, it really tells you that um, C60 is present, but it also tells you that these bands are C60 bands. And so once we recognize that, we could go back to other uh, spectra that we had collected with Spitzer. And once we did that, we discovered that these C60 bands were present in many more environments. This is the reflection nebula NGC 723. Here's the illuminating star. There's a cavity around it. There is, this is the surface of the cloud that's being illuminated by this star. And uh, this is the uh, photodissociation region, the PDR. And uh, this area we have mapped spectrally. Uh, so for each point, we have a, a spectrum. And then we can analyze those spectra and we can um, determine what the characteristics are of the spectrum. And then we can recognize this is position one, which is uh, way up here, far, far away. The star is down here, very far away from the star. And it's really dominated by PEHs. But when we get closer to the star, then we can start to pick up these C60 molecules. Here are their signatures. And we can then uh, color code this image. We can color code it, blue being um, C60, green being pass, and red being the background uh, cloud. And you can see that uh, the, the pH is sort of disappear, uh, get less abundant when you get close to the star, while the, the C60 molecule increases. And we can actually do that in a, uh, in a quantitative way. This is the abundance of the PEHs. It ranges from about 7% of the carbon down to about 2% of the carbon. This is far from the star in the photodissociation region. This is close to the star uh, where the UV radiation field is very strong. At the same time, you see the C60 molecule actually increasing. And so what we think is going on here is that uh, the paths are being destroyed by uh, these uh, the, UV uh, photons from the star, and uh, most of them get destroyed, but some of them get transformed into the C60, uh, the C60 molecule. And so this is schematically what we think is happening. So you, you start off here in the right uh, uh, top corner with a PEH, you shine UV light on it, you strip off then all the halogens, you form a graphene sheet, then you start to lose carbon atoms, and so you evolve to smaller species, flats, and eventually rings and chains. 
But while you do that, you may also isomerize. And when you isomerize, you will form these cages, and those can they isomerize more until they form these uh, very stable molecules, these, uh, the buckyball and the C70, the uh, American football. And, and this, we think, happens particularly when you have a, a UV-rich environment where you can strip off those halogens and strip off the carbon and start this whole process. The process of fragmentation on one hand and the competition with the isomerization on the other hand. And, and just to illustrate what can happen, this is a, a, is a scanning electron microscope image of a surface. Here is a little graphene sheet on this surface and it's it's hard to see in the uh, in the video that I will play in a minute. And so I have these little stills here down uh, of this movie that illustrate what happens. You start off with a graphene uh, flake, and you start to uh, knock out uh, carbon atoms with these hot electrons. It will uh, uh, turn into a case and eventually a soccer ball. So let me start this video. You can see it here. Here you can see that it starts from here is that uh, that uh, cage, and here is the uh, is the soccer ball that actually can now roll over the surface uh, very well. And so this is using electron radiation, uh, which is of course not very relevant for interstellar space. It's on the surface, it's not very relevant for interstellar space. But um, uh, we can do these kind of experiments also in, uh, in our laboratory. And so this is uh, uh, an instrument uh, developed at our uh, institute. This is a uh, ion trap. We, uh, 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 we evaporate a uh, sample of PEHs, we ionize it, we guide them into the ion trap, and then we illuminate them with UV photons, with a laser. And this is then the trace that we then analyzed uh, the, the results of that using a mass spectrometer. And this is the result of it. And you can see that we start off here with a uh, light PEH, 42 carbon atoms, 18 hydrogen atoms, and we start off by kicking off the hydrogens one by one, uh, until we wind up with the cluster and then we form, uh, start to lose uh, more uh, carbon atoms. And you can see that very well here. This is at um, five, oops, this is at five megajoule, uh, millijoules. This is at 15 millijoules uh, laser power. And you can see that now you start to lose uh, two carbon atoms at a time until you get to C32. And at that point, you actually fragment completely and you form these chains. So this is for C42. We now can look at some different species. This is the, the soccer ball C60. And uh, when we eliminated that in the same way in our uh, iron trap, you can see that you uh, kick out two carbon at a time. The, the, the cage will shrink, the soccer ball will shrink. You can see that there are some uh, 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 structures that are more stable than others that have a higher abundance 56 for example 50 also 44 those are more stable forms than the say the uh, 40 uh, the 46 or the 48. this is c70 you can see the same thing happen you break it down and then you form c60 c60 is of course a uh, is a uh, very magic number and very stable and uh, but then you see the same pattern evolving this is now uh, C66H26, and you start off by knocking off the hydrogens, and then you have a C66, and that will start to evolve by losing uh, carbon atoms, and it has the same kind of pattern, the same kind of uh, magic numbers. And uh, so we think that the same kind of process is happening uh, here as well. This is a, 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 excuse me, this was at 266 nanometers uh, laser uh, irradiation. This is 532 nanometers. And the special thing about 532 is that uh, C60 doesn't absorb there. So it's heavily, uh, ha happily sitting there, even under irradiation of 120 uh, millijoules. Uh, this is C70. You can see that it starts to break down uh, until it reaches C60. It shrinks until it has this soccer ball, and at that point stops because C60 doesn't absorb. It's sort of left behind, you don't see smaller fragments. This is C66H26. You can see that it breaks down. You can see that it does form some smaller fragments, but actually C60 is very abundant here as well. So we think that uh, a fair fraction of these uh, paths, after they have lost their hydrogen, and start to fragment, have isomerized and formed these buckyballs. 
And when we look at the uh, at our experiments, we think that this process is part effective. You know, one uh, every four under these conditions forms uh, the uh, the uh, buckyball. And that has some uh, interesting implications. Uh, and uh, uh, I already showed you the uh, detection of C60 uh, uh, in uh, in the infrareds. We now have also seen C60 uh, at cat's iron in the visible. These are the diffuse interstellar bands that are actually shown here. And uh, there are about 400 of them known, but I want you to focus on, uh, on these two here, because those are, uh, I flipped it here, those are due to, uh, uh, to the C60 uh, uh, cation. C60 cation. And uh, that's a very positive identification. We now see not only those two bands due, those electronic bands due to these, uh, to this, but there are an additional three weaker bands that we have also identified. So C60 plus is present in the diffuse interstellar medium because it is so very, very uh, uh, stable. And uh, there is a corollary to, to this. Uh, if we think about uh, how there, are, there are 400 strong, uh, 400 diffuse interstellar bands, but there are a few that are very strong, six or so. And if you uh, try to uh, determine what the, uh, what the abundance of the carrier, then uh, you have to be fairly abundant. This is, uh, this is the abundance along this axis. This is the number of carbon atoms. You, of course, have to be very stable, so you have to be very large. Uh, you can't be too large because then you have a problem with the abundances. Uh, uh, um, but uh, this is the kind of abundances that you want to, that, that these carriers need to have. And, and this is the abundance of C60 plus uh, as measured. So you can see that is the, in, the, in the range of those very strong ones. Uh, this is what you would get if there were uh, all of the all of the paths were in the form of ten grand paths. So most of the uh, 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 of uh, of the of the uh, paths were present in the form of uh, one of ten uh, grand paths. You can see that you then have an abundance which is capable of explaining uh, the the strongest dips. If you have 100 grand paths present, so 100, if the interstellar path family consists of 100 grand paths, then it means that you can explain the, 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 the 5780, which is still a very strong band. And then you have a lot of weaker bands and very weak bands that are uh, may not very abundant, don't contain very much uh, carbon atoms. But what I want to impress on you is that if you want to explain these strong bands, then you need something that's very abundant. And that also means that it should be present in the infrared because we can pick out individual bands in, uh, due to individual molecules in, these, uh, in, the, in the spectrum. Uh, the C60 plus, the C60 band, uh, we can pick out in the spectrum. So the carriers of these, uh, these diffuse interstellar bands, the strongest diffuse interstellar bands, should be able to uh, be picked out in the infrared. Uh, this is for comparison uh, the abundance of some small molecules in a very shielded environment of a dark molecular cloud core. And you can see that uh, small molecules um, really decrease very rapidly in abundance, and that's because you build them up uh, one, molecule, one atom at a time, basically. And uh, so um, uh, the, that's not a very efficient process to make large, uh, large molecules. And, and certainly those would not survive in the diffuse interstellar medium. So let me take you back to where I started, to um, uh, the questions that I raised at the beginning. What is the organic inventory of space, particularly in regions of star and planet formation? Uh, how complex can it uh, get to be? What does it contribute to uh, the origin of life? I've talked about what is the role of molecules in the evolution of the universe, particularly of power molecules, and I've illustrated the use of molecules to study the universe itself. And then it's important to realize that we live in the in in the golden age of astronomy we have missions that go up and uh, that uh, every couple of years and that show us part of the universe that we didn't even know that existed and up here you see the kepler and tess and plato missions that are uh, detecting planets through their uh, transient uh, effect on the on the uh, starlight you can see that every time the planet crosses in front of the star, you see a little dip uh, appearing because it takes away a little bit of the light of the star. That's how we discover the presence of planets. 
This is the ALMA telescope uh, on the high uh, plains of the Atacama Desert in Chile, which can be used, uh, particularly used, to study molecules in the universe through their rotational uh, spectra. This is the uh, uh, Sophia aircraft. This is Boeing 747. It's opened up in the, in the rear. There's a cavity here, and you can see a mirror, a two and a half meter mirror. At altitude, you can open up this cavity and you can observe the universe in the far infrared, unobscured by all the uh, water in the atmosphere. And that's the main, uh, the main issue when you want to observe uh, the uh, uh, molecules in the, uh, in the infrared. This then is the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, which will be launched in uh, 2021. It's a, a, a six and a half meter, which will fold open in, uh, in, uh, in space and which will be uh, particularly useful to study uh, the, the kind of molecules that I've been talking about, these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules, because this has spectrometers on board with unprecedented uh, resolution and sensitivity. And the, the main thing that they will see is these, uh, these large molecules. The main spectral signature that they will see is these large molecules. So this is how uh, what astronomers care about, but we have also seen a revolution in the region of, uh, of the planetary system. This is the Cassini-Huygens mission, which uh, went to, uh, to uh, um, uh, Saturn, and the Huygens mission was dropped into the uh, atmosphere of the largest uh, moon, the Titan moon. And the moon on Titan has an atmosphere which consists mainly of hydrocarbons and, uh, and uh, nitrogen. And you can see uh, when you go into here, you can see there's a very interesting chemistry, very reminiscent of the early Earth. Uh, you can see here is all these structures here. You see these rocks uh, appearing. You see these stream beds appearing. Those are not liquid water. Those are due to liquid methane. And uh, Huygen studied the, uh, the process that took place in uh, the Titan uh, atmosphere as an analog for understanding processes that took place in the, uh, on the Earth in the early solar system. This is uh, the Rosetta mission, which was a, a cometary mission from ESA that went to a nearby comet that landed a lander and uh, that uh, studied the composition of the comets. And one of the things it discovered is that the comets already have, the comets have um, amino acids. They discovered glycine uh, on this, uh, this comet. So comets can indeed bring interesting molecules to uh, the early Earth uh, or to terrestrial planets. This is the Stardust mission. It, it's a mission that went to, uh, to a nearby comet when it was close to the comet. It folded out a tray and that tray had uh, aerogel and uh, it, it, it collected dust particles from this uh, comet in that, uh, that aerogel. You can see here this folding open. Here is the tray coming out. So and it's going to collect dust particles that are going to impact on it. Once it was uh, a, a mission was completed, it folded in again. It folded back. It came back to the Earth and was collected uh, in the uh, Nevada desert. And this was the first time that we got extraterrestrial material that we collected elsewhere uh, back to Earth. First time since uh, the moon landing. And of course, the moon uh, landing brought a few hundred kilograms. This mission brought a, um, a few micrograms to the back. Fortunately, our uh, detection uh, and our analysis uh, uh, has become much more sensitive, and we have been able to analyze the, what's present in, this, uh, in, these, uh, in these grains. And one of the things we discovered is again the presence of glycine, of a simple uh, amino acid that uh, a comet can have brought to the, uh, to the Earth. This then is the Curiosity uh, rover. It's one of the rovers on the uh, surface of Mars. And uh, what's special about it is that uh, it not only had cameras, but it also had a little scoop that it could use to dig out some Earth, actually some Mars, and put it into a little beaker that then could analyze and uh, for, for the composition. And I think the next one, the one that uh, just uh, is going to land on, uh, on Mars, it uh, will actually have a, a, a laboratory that's particularly geared towards the presence, to detecting the presence of interesting organic species on Mars. 
This is on the last mission that I want to bring up. That's the Juice mission. The Juice mission goes uh, to uh, the icy moons around uh, Jupiter. And the special thing about these icy moons is that there is a thick crust of ice, but underneath that ice is a uh, is an ocean, uh, which is uh, produced by uh, the heating due to the tidal interaction with uh, with uh, Jupiter. And in this ocean, there, there seem to be uh, uh, organics present as well. And these organics, uh, may, uh, uh, th this ocean could be very much like uh, the ocean underneath uh, in the lake beds in the Antarctica that I showed at the early times. So we're learning a lot. There's a lot of uh, very stimulating missions going out. And our view of the universe has changed considerably over the last um, 30, 40 years. So the years that I have been active in the field, I have seen, seen the, the universe change because of all of these missions. And then what I want to be uh, want to impress on you, particularly on the students, is that uh, astronomy is very precise. We measure things very precisely, but the accuracy of what we can infer from those measurements really requires the uh, uh, contributions from a uh, from from a molecular physicist, from physical chemists, spectroscopists, planetary scientists, and geophysicists and geochemists, and then also, of course, our astronomical uh, observers and uh, and models. And all of these people have to work together in order to uh, to uh, uh, translate those pretty pictures, those spectra that we take into actually an understanding uh, of uh, the processes that play a role in the origin and evolution uh, of our universe and the origin and evolution of life in the universe. And then uh, let me turn here to the students and give a student perspective here. Space missions cost a billion dollars and more. The James Webb Space uh, Telescope will cost uh, close to $10 billion. But the scientific success of these missions really depends on what these lone graduate students are measuring in their, uh, in their lab, the parameters, the molecular parameters that they determine, because that's how we can turn these, uh, this data that we collect into an a, a understanding of, a, of, a, of, of the universe. And, and uh, again, let me, let me uh, say that... Uh, any laboratory study is relevant somewhere in the universe. Somewhere in the universe, the, the molecule that you're studying in the lab or the process that you're probing uh, in the lab is, uh, is nature is using that somewhere in the universe to uh, create wondrous things. And uh, your challenge as a grad student will be to find out where in the universe that is. And with that uh, assignment, mm -hmm. let me then turn the, the floor back to questions. Thank you, Professor Chillens. So we'll take up the question now. Okay, so I'll read you the first question. Uh, it's about the quantum en entanglement and Sheldrake morphologic resonances. What are these involved in making these molecules? This is way beyond my pay grade. I, uh, okay. This is not something that I could say. Uh, uh, that I could uh, comment on in, in, in a meaningful way. I know too little of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Ashok Ambasta. How do the molecules survive dissociation in hot regions, such as in starburst regions as in the Orion? Uh, that's a that's a very interesting question, and and uh, they sort of carry their protection with them because uh, think about these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They are a chicken wire of carbon atoms, but then they're decorated with hydrogen atoms at the edge. A UV photon that will come in will excite this, and it may fragment it, and the weakest link will go first, and the weakest link is the hydrogen. So it will knock off a hydrogen. But the next thing that may happen is that the other hydrogen atom will collide with it and will react with it and will restore the, 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 the molecule as it is. So it's only photodissociation, photofragmentation is only important in regions where UV photons are very rich, but hydrogen atoms are not. 
As long as the hydrogen atoms are around, you're sort of protected. So in the photo dissociation region, like, like NGC 7023 that I showed, in the surface of that cloud, your pHs are fairly stable. But when you get them closer to the star, you can see that they strip off these hydrogens. You can see that the soccer ball is being formed. And it's only when you get very, very close to the star that you destroy them. Thank you. And we'll move to the next question from R.G. Troy from PRL. What are the possible routes of a fuller information in those regions where the UV flux is sufficiently low? Uh, again, a very interesting question. I wish I knew the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, can can C60 be formed in, uh, in, in, in uh, where you don't have UV photons around, where you only have carbon atoms? And can you build use those to build up bigger and bigger structures? Uh, that's a question that has not been answered. Uh, and it would be a very interesting assignment for a student uh, to work on. Uh, 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 it, it means actually probing uh, the chemical reactions that are relevant in these environments. Uh, so the radical, radical reactions uh, and uh, uh, how do you activate uh, a species? Uh, I mean, you typically will form saturated molecules, but you have to activate them if you want to grow them. And so there are interesting avenues that could be followed, but it hasn't been done yet. Okay, thank you. So I think, yeah, certainly this can be taken as a problem for students. And the next question again from the same person, Arjit Roy. Can shock heating of PAHs give rise to C60 and other forms of fullerene? Uh, that is possible. Uh, they may, some suit uh, structures do have a fullerene like uh, structure. If you form suit at fairly high temperatures, so not the kind of suit that you form in your car engine, your car engine will form, a, will form a, a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, pollution. But if you form a, a suit at much higher temperatures, then it has a fullerene like kind of structure. And then in the shock, you can actually break that down and then you would be left over with the most stable forms, which would be these, uh, these buckyballs. Okay, thank you. Right, so the next question, I got it over the phone uh, from Dr. Gupta. Maybe he's watching on the mobile, so he couldn't type it. So he, his question is, whether life on Earth started due to comets or meteorite impact, as well predicted. Well, that's that's where uh, we have really uh, learned a lot over the last um, 20, 30 years. Huh? Uh, when Hoyle made this uh, suggestion, uh, uh, the, the, the thinking was that it was all Yuri Miller kind of experiments. You had a reducing atmosphere and uh, you formed uh, simple molecules, amino acids, uh, using the structure of synthesis. But we now know that um, that doesn't always work. And in oxidizing environment, that, may not, that, that will not work. And the Earth may have been highly oxidizing originally. And uh, we also now know that indeed comets uh, do have um, uh, amino acids. Comets um, do uh, have interesting, uh, prebiotically interesting uh, molecules. And comets really were very important early on in the Earth. The, the late heavy bombardment uh, brought uh, a veneer, you know, uh, of 1% of the mass of the Earth or so uh, in, in, in these kinds of species. So, yes, could very well be um, very relevant. If not at the Earth, but certainly on other planets. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. And the next question is by Mr. Man Manas Samal. How about using PAH for estimating the star forming regions of molecular clouds in the solar neighborhood? Will it be a good choice? Uh, that's, and that's a question I would have to think about. Um, uh, on, on, a, on a global scale, on a large scale, huh, if you talk about uh, things on the scale of um, a few kiloparsecs or, or the scale of a galaxy, um, PHs would be a good indicator of, um, of the star formation rate in um, in uh, in a galaxy like uh, like our own. Uh, how how much you can break that down to what the smaller scales you can go uh, is not clear to me. 
and and uh, may, probably uh, may, the, the star formation rates uh, may could be well determined for something like a, like a spy alarm, but don't think for Orion itself, uh, for example. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, the next question is from uh, Mr. Melan C from the Indian Center for Space Physics in Calcutta. Could you please comment on the formation of complex organic molecules considering PAH as a substrate? Again, yeah, th these are very, very interesting questions, and they are at the forefront of um, uh, of, the, of research. Huh? Um, uh, much of the surface area in the interstellar medium may be in the form of these molecules, and uh, they have some advantage over um, uh, the typical dust grains in the sense that uh, it's easier to chemisorb uh, species, and uh, may you, it's perhaps also easier to uh, to activate them, to activate molecules on the surface through, uh, through binding or uh, collecting an, an iron atom on it, that could be uh, the the area, an active a chemically active area. And uh, these are very interesting questions um, that that are very interesting to study. That's the that's the, the best answer I can give. So actually following that previous question, um, uh, I would like to ask a follow up of that. Why we are not calling the grand PAHs as dust? Because they are as large as to be a dust, right? So. Well, there are the only 50 carbon atoms. Huh? We're talking about really things which, um, which are small, small compared to a dust grain. A dust grain is 100 angstroms. It's, um, it's uh, 100,000 or, um, or so atoms. and and. You know, then it doesn't really matter what the specific are of that dust grain. It will have generic properties. But a molecule, you know, it is specific. We can name them. They have specific properties, like like uh, uh, theobromine and uh, and caffeine. They have different properties, and those can be used uh, specifically to drive uh, specific chemical reactions or make specific uh, species that are perhaps very interesting. Okay, thank you. All right, and the next question is from Mr. Ambar. Would you like to brief about the more filled space in atomic structures? Uh, okay, then we will move on to the next question. Uh, this is from uh, Rahul, he's from PRL. Uh, can you please brief about the formation mechanism of grand PAH in ISM? Well, uh, you think that pHs are formed in stellar outflows, just like in a suiting candle, just like in your car engine when you drive home uh, later today. It's uh, you form these when you have a, a high temperature gas and it cools down, and you form uh, pHs, and then those agglomerate into uh, into dust particles, forming soot particles. Now, in space. You can uh, well start off with a very broad family because these um, these environments, these uh, hot environments, are not very restrictive. But in space, you then start to process this, and so you knock off all the weak structures. All the weak structures are knocked off first, and so you're left with the most stable structures, structures like C60, but also structures like these uh, these grandpas. We have a big question from uh, Professor uh, Halyom Watts. How far in the future it is likely that we learn life is really there elsewhere? That is, um, will be some time. Uh, we, we now sent up missions to um, a chart basically the uh, architecture of uh, planetary systems around other stars. And, and what you're asking is, uh, when will we be able to actually go in and uh, measure the composition of, say, the atmospheres of these stars? And, and uh, some of that will be done by, by James Webb. James Webb will be able to, uh, to measure the composition of um, uh, hot Jupiter-like stars, uh, hot Jupiter-like planets. But in order to measure uh, the composition of a terrestrial planet, the atmosphere of a terrestrial planet, you need to go a magnitude larger. You need to send up a 30-meter telescope. 
And in, in the US, people are talking about this. It's, it's the concept of the uh, origins mission. Um, I think that's now in a concept phase. Uh, uh, talking about it, if they were to start now, they would have it uh, flying somewhere 2035. I think if you're realistic, it would be more like 2050. And I think then you could do maybe 10 uh, terrestrial planets that you could investigate this with terrestrial planets in the habitable zone and in investigate the uh, the atmospheres. If you want to go one step further than that and actually also find the signatures of life, then uh, we are talking uh, uh, great, even more uh, difficult. I think then you may have to uh, do an inventory of many, many, many uh, planets before you find ones that actually have a, a clear signature that we will accept as a, as a signature of uh, of life. Okay, yeah, thank you. I have, I have one more question, which is there in my mind for such a long time. In the astrochemical context, what is a simple molecule and what is a complex molecule? Uh, uh, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Huh? Uh, uh, that is in the eye of the beholder. Um, uh, uh, as astronomers <laughs> talk about uh, complex molecules in regions of um, uh, hot cores around massive stars or uh, hot corinos around low mass stars. And then they talk about um, uh, molecules that have uh, more than one carbon atom, maybe two or three carbon atoms, and that's called um, a, a complex. Hey, dimethyl ether. It's um, a, a two carbon atoms and an oxygen atom and a, and, and a number of hydrogen atoms. That's called a complex molecule in, uh, in uh, astrochemistry. If you were to tell that to a, a biochemist, then he would uh, start laughing because to him, of course, a complex molecule is DNA uh, or protein. And so that's a completely different scale. Thank you. And there is one more question from uh, Rahul from PRL. What are the contribution of bottom-up bottom -up process for the formation of grand pH? In the ISM? That, that is not well defined. Uh, we now do see uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult to find comp uh, large molecules through the rotational signature because they have so many rotational states that um, uh, the population any given state is, is very small. It means that the bands are very weak. And, and for linear molecules, um, the, the, the density of state is relatively low, but, but if you go to something like a PDA, it's, it becomes very, very, uh, very large. And that means that it's very difficult to find the technical sig sig signal. Now we have now um, benzene, the benzonitrile, that has been discovered in, uh, in space uh, unequivocally in uh, the, the TARDIS molecular cloud uh, core, the TMC1. And it has a relatively large uh, abundance. There are some uh, indications that naphthalene, the, the naphtho uh, nitrile, is also present. That uh, is still uh, under investigation. And uh, uh, you need to find a couple of these, these species and see what their abundance is, and then try to link together what the processes are that uh, link these uh, molecules, and then try to extrapolate that to something which is as big as 50 carbon atoms. And so that's, that's still a very, uh, very much a step uh, uh, away from us. Um, uh, you need a very uh, sensitive uh, telescope uh, at um, a sort of the 10 gigahertz uh, uh, regime. And, and uh, Arecibo was used for this kind of a study. Um, but of, of course, Arecibo is now, uh, is now down and will be uh, broken apart. Maybe that the Chinese uh, telescope being developed, uh, that that will take over in this, uh, this area. I'll to unmute. Yeah, thank you. So there are no more questions and it's already about, I think, one hour and 25 minutes nearly. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor Tillens. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I'll uh, now hand it over to uh, Dean of PRL, Professor Pallam Raju. Thank you, uh, Bala, for conducting this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bala, for uh, doing this. And uh, 
Uh, thank you, you know, Professor Chilens, for such wonderful, informative, you know, exciting and illuminating talk that you uh, gave. And uh, you really um, put our knowledge, actually, as of, of the universe has increased multifold by the way you have brought the importance of molecules and the way you have put it in simple terms, both in your work and this talk. I really appreciate it. And we are really grateful to you for that. And we would have actually, you know, um, love to have you here, which we probably will plan in the, in the future when travel restrictions, you know, uh, are not there and it's safe for everybody. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely have you here for more in-person interactions, especially our students also will really greatly, uh, you know, uh, get enriched by the knowledge that you bring in. And uh, I, I thank you once again for uh, joining. Uh, and uh, before we um, uh, close this session, it is my pleasure to announce the colloquium of the next week, which is uh, by Professor Pankaj Joshi, Vice Chancellor of Charusat University and Founding Director of the International Center for Cosmology. And uh, uh, he is going to uh, talk us on another exciting topic, just the way we had today. And that is uh, that title is uh, Beyond Penrose, Black Holes and Space-Time Sing uh, Singularities. So uh, please uh, join us uh, for, that, uh, for that colloquium next Wednesday, uh, which will be on a regular time at 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and uh, it's a PRL colloquium day. Please mark it in your calendar. And uh, uh, thank you all once again for joining us. Thanks to our uh, speaker and to the colleagues who are joining us from the University of Maryland and the University See you next week. Bye-bye. Uh, Take care and stay safe. Thank you.